Alcatraz prison harbored the most dangerous criminals. No one has yet managed to escape from it. The jailer who was sorting through the prisoner's letters wanted to keep it that way, thoughtfully looked at the next letter from one of his prisoners, Victor Lustig. This man was called the most cunning con man of the 20th century. He managed to fool almost half of America, making millions of dollars in the process. Now sitting behind bars, he complained about his health and begged for a doctor to see him. Even if he succeeded in outwitting many people while he was free, he would no longer be able to do that in prison. With this thought, the jailer threw the letter away. What happened to Victor Lustig during the last days of his life is well known, but his early years are cloaked in secrecy. He told some acquaintances that he grew up in a family of aristocrats and his father was a mayor. To others, he said that his parents were poor farmers. Both of these stories were probably fictitious, as well as his name. It is only known that he was born in 1890 in the city of Hostine, a hundred kilometers from Prague. Lustig said that he was on the street by the age of 12, but this may not be true either. Anyway, the future crook realized early on that being on the other side of the law was much more attractive to him. At the age of 18, he was arrested for theft by the Prague police. While living in Paris, Victor spent his time picking pockets, gambling, and having affairs with married women. One of those ended with a deep scar on his left cheek, a mark left by a jealous husband. An article in the True Detective Mysteries magazine described his skills as follows. By the time he reached adulthood, Lustig could make a deck of cards do everything but talk. After his adventures in Paris, Victor decided to explore the sea. Between 1909 and the outbreak of World War I, he sailed on cruise ships between Paris and New York, looking for victims among first-class passengers. During one of these cruises, Lustig met Nicky Arstein, a professional gambler and con artist. Arstein immediately liked the talented boy and taught Victor all of his tricks. He convinced his protege that he could achieve much more if he merged into high society. Victor bought himself expensive suits and spent several months learning aristocratic manners. This is how the persona of Count Victor Lustig a noble native of the Kingdom of Bohemia, was born. Nicky Arstein's teachings formed the basis of Lustig's Ten Commandments of the Con, a set of instructions that he developed over the years. 1. Be a patient listener. It is this, not fast talking, that gets a con man his coups. 2. Never look bored. 3. Wait for the other person to reveal any political opinions then agree with them. 4. Let the other person reveal religious views, then have the same ones. 5. Hint at sex talk, but don't follow it up unless the other fellow shows a strong interest. 6. Never discuss illness unless some special concern is shown. 7. Never pry into a person's personal circumstances. They'll tell you all eventually. 8. Never boast. Just let your importance be quietly obvious. 9. Never be untidy. 10. Never get drunk. The outbreak of World War I made sea travel unsafe. Victor decided to settle in the United States. There he invented a scam called the Romanian Box, a machine that could duplicate money. It was a square wooden box with a narrow slot at either end and a series of knobs and dials. It all looked very convincing. While demonstrating how the box worked, Lustig put a hundred dollar bill in one slot and a piece of paper in the other. Then he turned the knobs and dials. The note and the paper were sucked into the box. Then there was a 12 hour wait while the money and paper allegedly soaked in a bath of secret chemicals inside the box. Hours later, Lustig turned the knobs and the machine coughed up two identical bills. What Lustig had done was hide a second $100 note in the box with the serial numbers carefully altered 
to match the one he used in the demonstration. If a potential buyer doubted, Victor took him to the bank and put the copied note on the deposit. Seeing the banker could not recognize the fake, the victim immediately agreed to buy the miracle box. The cost depended on the wealth of the buyer, from $10,000 to $100,000. By the time the deception was revealed, the fraudster was already far away. The most ingenious thing about this scam was that no one could report Victor to the police. After all, by doing so, the victim would have confessed to trying to sell counterfeit money, which is a severe crime. In the mid-1920s, Victor returned to Paris. In those days, the city authorities were busy with the question, what to do with the Eiffel Tower? Nowadays, the Eiffel Tower is the symbol of Paris. But initially, it was conceived as a temporary structure for the World's Fair in 1889. The tower's lifespan had long passed, and the restoration required a lot of money. Therefore, the government considered demolishing it. Moreover, many Parisians spoke negatively about it, believing that the metal structure ruined the city's view. Victor Lustig learned about the problem from a newspaper, and then he came up with a brilliant idea for a new scam. What if he passed himself off as a government official and offered scrap metal dealers to buy out the rights to dismantle the structure? Victor hired a forger to prepare all the necessary documents. Once he was ready, Lustig invited five leading scrap metal dealers to a confidential meeting at an expensive hotel. He identified himself as the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Posts and Telegraphs. Then the adventurer organized a closed auction where each guest could put forward his money offer. Among those invited, Lustig noticed André Poisson, an insecure young man whose business was just beginning to gain momentum. Victor took him aside and promised that he would give the grant to him for a small reward. Thinking that otherwise he would have no chance to outbid the competitors, the businessman happily agreed. So Victor received not only a tidy sum for the sale of 7,000 tons of scrap metal, but also a large bribe. In terms of modern money, he made about a million dollars from this scam. Then he fled to Austria and waited for a scandal to break out in Paris. To his surprise, there was no reaction. Like many of his previous victims, Poisson was ashamed of his foolishness and did not report the incident to the police. Six months later, Victor returned to Paris and decided to pull the trick again. This time it didn't turn out so well. The deceived businessman immediately reported the incident to the authorities, but Lustig managed to slip away again. Using forged documents, he fled to the United States. By this time, Victor Lustig had already married and had a daughter. The great schemer was always on the road with his family, moving from hotel to hotel. He loved to pamper his family with expensive gifts, and he was fond of gambling. This kind of life cost a pretty penny. The need for money and adrenaline made him go on to the riskiest adventures. One time, Victor allegedly managed to outsmart the most dangerous man in Chicago, Al Capone. Lustig convinced the Mafia boss to invest $50,000 in a stock deal, promising that the investment would double in 60 days. The con man then kept the money given to him in a safe deposit box. A few months later, he told Al Capone that the deal had fallen through, but he would return $50,000 out of his own pocket as a sign of respect. At this point, Lustig made the notorious gangster believe that the failure of the deal had stripped him of all means of supporting himself. Impressed with Lustig's honesty, Capone gave him $5,000. Al Capone never realized that what he got back was his own money, and Lustig made $5,000 on top of the percentage fee. However, there is no confirmation of this story. Victor may have simply made it up. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, Victor Lustig became one of the most successful counterfeiters in the United States. He went into partnership with a chemist named Tom Shaw. 
and a talented engraver, William Watts, to conduct a large-scale counterfeiting operation. He sold about a million modern dollars a month in counterfeit cash. The scale of this enterprise was such that it could even shake the country's already fragile economy. This time the feds took Victor seriously. One of the best agents, Peter Rubano, vowed to put him behind bars and spent the next few years in a game of cat and mouse with the elusive con man. In 1935, Rubano received an anonymous tip regarding Lustig's location. It is not known who turned in the greatest swindler of the 20th century. Most likely, it was revenge by a deceived mistress. Victor was arrested at a New York hotel. While awaiting a trial in a temporary detention cell, Lustig noticed that no one counted the sheets given to prisoners. Having collected enough of them, he tied a rope, cut the bars in the shower room, went downstairs and escaped. However, the adventurer did not manage to enjoy his freedom for a long time. A couple of weeks later, the feds detained him near a private school where Victor's daughter studied. The famous swindler was sentenced to 20 years in prison. To prevent him from escaping again, Lustig was sent to Alcatraz, believed to be the most secure prison in America. His new name in prison was 300, which was his numerical identity as a prisoner. Within the prison walls, Victor's health began to deteriorate. He overwhelmed the guards with requests to see a doctor. But when it became clear that this was not another trick and Lustig got sick for real, it was too late. He was transferred to the medical center for federal prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, where he died of pneumonia in March 1947. His death certificate read, Apprentice Salesman. Later, historians searched through archives attempting to find some information about the great con man's birth and childhood. But not a single person who could have been Victor Lustig was found in the official documents. We're done here. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to enjoy new episodes of How It Was.